Well, the thing I, I, I'm super excited about is in a lot of ways, we've, we're close to artificial general intelligence, but we're also close to artificial general robotics. That is Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA. In this interview on the podcast, No Priors, Jensen Huang makes some incredible predictions about artificial general intelligence, robotics, and how AI is going to impact science and engineering. So let's watch and I'll give you my thoughts. In this first part, he's going to talk about AI and robotics, how very soon we're going to have humanoid robots and other types of robots in every aspect of society. And here's the thing, I just got back from CES and during his keynote, speech, he basically said the same thing. He thinks 2025 is going to be the year of humanoid robots. Tokens are tokens. I mean, the question is, can you tokenize it? We can pickle that! Tokenizing things is not easy, uh, as you guys know. But if you were able to tokenize things, um, align it with large, large language models and other modalities, if I can generate a video that has Jensen reaching out to pick up the coffee cup, why can't I prompt a robot to generate the tokens to pick up the, it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so intuitively you would think that the problem statement is rather similar for a computer. And, and so I, I think that we're that close. That's incredibly exciting. All right, so I'd actually never heard that phrase before, if you can tokenize it, which is super interesting to think about. It's kind of like how computation has been for the last 50 years. If you can represent something in ones and zeros, then you can use a computer to simulate it. And this is very similar. If you can tokenize something, whether it's a movement as he showed or text, which is obviously kind of the base unit of tokens, then you can use artificial intelligence to generate predictions of what comes next. So I think we're going to be hearing that a lot. Can you tokenize it? Now, the the two the two brownfield uh, robotic systems, brownfield meaning that you don't have to change the environment for. Now, that's really interesting. That is another term I hadn't heard before prior to CES, brownfield. Brownfield means that you don't have to change the environment. That is why humanoid robots have so much potential because they are built like humans, which means they can operate within the environments that humans operate in. And the entire world is built for humans and automobiles. And so that means if a robot is in the form of a humanoid or a car, it'll work really easily with our existing infrastructure and not much more is needed. And that's a really important distinction. I think there were a lot of predictions for a while that robots were going to come in all shapes and sizes, which might be the case, but the primary form factor of a robot seems likely to be humanoid. And that's because everything was built for humans. So figure robots, unitary robots, which I actually got to interact with at the NVIDIA event. Of course, we have Boston Dynamics. Of course, we have Tesla's Optimus robot. So a lot of humanoid robots coming. Let's keep watching. Is uh, self-driving cars and, and um, with digital chauffeurs and embodied robots, right? Between the cars and the human robot, uh, we, we could literally um, bring robotics to the world without changing the world because we built a world for those two things. Mm -hmm. So there it is. He said exactly what I said. And he also said the same thing at his CES keynote. The world is built for cars and humans. And that's why if we build robots embodied AI in the form of those two things, it's going to be the easiest way to bring robots to the entire world. Probably not a coincidence that, that Elon's focused on those two forms of so robotics because uh, it is likely to have the largest potential scale. And, and so I, I think that, that that's exciting. But the digital version of it is equally exciting. You know, we're talking about digital or AI employees. All right, so in this next section, he is going to talk about AI's effect on employment and the workforce. This is actually something that I've talked about a lot recently from AI joining the workforce to kind of the future effects of this and what it means for both capital and labor, something that I really am interested in and we'll be talking much more about this year. Thanks to Emergence AI for partnering with me on this video. If you've watched this channel at all, you know I'm bullish on agents and especially especially agents that can accomplish real world tasks for you. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Emergence AI. Emergence AI just launched their enterprise grade multi-agent orchestrator and they showed off the first demo of a real world use case where these agents can actually browse the web on your behalf. This is enhanced web automation. This means multiple agents can go out and dynamically interact with different elements on the web under this intelligent orchestration to bring human-like interaction and navigation, but 
at machine level scale. And what's really cool about this is these agents can actually perform complex and sophisticated web interactions that previously required a human. They can navigate dynamic early loading menus, fill out forms, adjust settings, process embedded files, and extract relevant data from PDFs and HTML. Emergence AI's orchestrator offers a combination of design time flexibility and runtime determinism. That basically means that these agents can heal themselves. So if it makes a mistake along the way, it can figure it out and then succeed on the next try. And Emergence AI has put a huge emphasis on privacy and security. They offer a fully hosted solution where you can access it via API or you can host it on your own virtual private cloud. So if you're an enterprise business and you're looking to automate a lot of your processes, Emergence AI is a great solution. Integrate their agent API and seamlessly orchestrate multiple agents to accomplish tasks for you and your business. This includes interacting with both modern and legacy enterprise applications. So Emergence AI is just starting to invite developers to try out their platform. Definitely check them out. Tell them I sent you, of course. Go to their website, emergence.ai, or simply email them, contact at emergence.ai. I'll drop all of the links in the description below. So thank you again to Emergence AI for partnering with me on this video. Now, back to the video. There's no question we're gonna have AI employees of all kinds, and our outlook will be some biologics and some artificial intelligence, and uh, we will prompt them in the same way. Isn't that right? Mostly I prompt my employees, I, you know, provide them context, um, ask them uh, to perform a mission. They go and uh, recruit other team members. Uh, they come back and, mm -hmm. and we're going back and forth. Uh, How is that going to be any different with digital and AI employees of all kinds? So we're going to have AI marketing people, AI chip designers, AI supply chain people, AI, you know, and and I'm I'm hoping that Nvidia is someday um, uh, biologically bigger, um, but also uh, from an artificial intelligence perspective, much much bigger. So I just covered Mark Zuckerberg talking about a ton of AI joining Meta as mid-level engineers, which of course super interesting, and it seems inevitable. 2025 is going to be the year of agents joining the workforce. Now he talks about context and prompting his own human employees. And it's kind of the same thing with agents and AI joining the workforce. You need to prompt them. They have to understand your business. They have to understand your goals, your limitations, your resources. And one problem that I see is onboarding. How do you onboard agents? You don't want to have to provide them manually with all of the context of your business every single time you bring a new agent on because you're going to be bringing thousands or even millions of agents onto your team. So the way to do that is to automate onboarding. That is giving them access to your internal materials, maybe an onboarding document. And by the way, all of this is the same thing you would do for a human employee. There is this ramp up period when a new person joins your team where they're learning all of the context of your business, they're learning your goals, they're learning how you work, what tools you use. And this is the same exact thing that needs to happen with AI, except with AI, it can all be defined with code, which is really interesting. You give them everything in a single document and they can be onboarded in minutes not days, weeks, or months, which is standard for a human employee. All right, in this next section, he's going to talk about AI's impact on science and engineering, another topic that I've talked quite a bit about. When we think about kind of the last bottleneck to reaching artificial superintelligence, it is the ability for artificial intelligence to do its own research and self-improve. Frontier math, frontier science, inventing or discovering, however you want to think about it, new math, new science, and then applying it to itself. And then at that point, it becomes recursive and then exponentially grows in quality and intelligence. That is what Leopold Aschenbrenner called the intelligence explosion as part of his situational awareness paper. Well, first of all, I think what what is misunderstood and 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 um, uh, misunderstood, maybe maybe underestimated, is the under the under the water activity, under the surface activity of uh, groundbreaking science, computer science, to science mm. and engineering that is being affected by AI and machine learning. I think you just can't walk into a science department anywhere, theoretical math department mm -hmm. anywhere, where AI and machine learning and the type of 
work that we're talking about today is going to transform tomorrow. If they are, if if you take all of the engineers in the world, all of the scientists in the world, and you say that... By the way, I just realized both of the interviewers are wearing black leather jackets, most likely because that's Jensen's signature look. The, the way they're working today is early indication of the future, because obviously it is. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to see a, a tidal wave of generative AI, a tidal wave of AI, a tidal wave of machine learning, change everything that we do in some short period of time. Now, remember, uh, I, I saw the early indications of, of computer vision and, and the work with, with um, uh, Alex and Ilya and, and Hinton at, 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 uh, in Toronto and um, uh, uh, Jan LeCun and and of course, Andrew Ang here in Stanford, and you know, I saw the early indications of it, um, and we were we were we were fortunate to have extrapolated from what was observed to be detecting cats mm -hmm. into a profound change in computer science. Yeah, it's kind of crazy the foresight that Jensen had to this new generative AI wave, and this was years ago when he's talking about the work that Alex and Ilya did. This was AlexNet when he's talking about detecting cats as simple image detection. Simple now, obviously, it was cutting edge at the time, but he was able to understand that really it was matrix multiplication that was making it all work. And extrapolating that, well, how do video games work? It's basically a lot of the same types of math functions. And so the same GPUs that NVIDIA was building for video games could power artificial intelligence as well. And so he extrapolated that all the way from, I believe it was 2010, 2012, where AlexNet was first released. And then he basically figured out, okay, we need to prepare ourselves for, and it took another decade before it really started to take off, but he positioned his entire company around artificial intelligence. And boy, what a visionary, what foresight. I don't think Jensen gets enough credit, obviously, aside from the market cap of his company, but boy, that was an incredible prediction. And not only just the prediction, but being able to align his entire company around it. So maybe one of the best executives of all time. All right, let's keep watching. And that extrapolation was fortunate for us. And now, of course, we we were we were uh, so excited by it, so inspired by it that we changed everything about how we did things. But that took how long? It took uh, literally six years from observing that toy, AlexNet, which I think by today's standards will be con considered a toy, mm -hmm. to superhuman levels of capabilities in, in object recognition. Well, that was only a few years. Uh, what is happening right now, the groundswell in all of the fields of science, not one field of science left behind. I mean, just to mm -hmm. be very clear, mm -hmm. okay? Everything from quantum computing to quantum chemistry, you know, every field of science is involved in in the, the approaches that we're talking about. If we give ourselves, and they've been at it for a couple, two, three years. If we give ourselves another couple, two, three years, the world's going to change. There's not going to be one paper. There's not going to be one breakthrough in science, one breakthrough in engineering where generative AI isn't at the foundation of it. I'm fairly certain of it mm -hmm. now. And so I, I think, I think um, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, I, every so often I hear about it, whether this is a fad. <laughs> um, uh, computer, you, you just got to go back to first principles and observe what is actually happening. The computing stack, the way we do computing has changed. If the way you write software has changed, I mean, that is pretty core. Mm -hmm. Software is how humans encode knowledge. All right, so pretty incredible statements. The entire computing stack has changed. Obviously, we're still in that transition period, but traditional software where everything is hard-coded or video games have game engines that were predefined, all of that is changing right now. Everything's gonna be generative and predictive. And it's really a cool thing to think about. I've made videos about the end of software and maybe there won't be the same level of software engineers in the future. I really do believe that because in the short and medium term, everything is moving to AI writing our code and then eventually everything is just predicted dynamically. One example being the Doom AI demo where every single frame of the game Doom was just generated in the moment, not predefined with a game engine. I think all software could potentially go there. And really all you need is that and then a database. And so you have the kind of ground truth in the database that is a traditional database. And then everything on top of the database is just generated or predicted in the moment. Very cool future to think about. You know, our algorithms, we encode it in a very different way now. That's gonna affect everything. 
nothing else will ever be the same. And so I, I think the the uh, I think I'm I'm talking to the converted here, and and we all see the same thing in all the startups that that you know you guys you guys work with, and the scientists I work with, and the engineers I work with. Nothing will be left behind. I mean, this we're going to take everybody with us. All right. So those are his thoughts. That was just a few weeks ago, and still hyper relevant. It's crazy to think that just a few weeks it might be old, but this is far from old. This is relevant, very interesting points by Jensen, the CEO of NVIDIA. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.